Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Question Time with myself, Harry Knight. Once again, I'm going to be going through some of the questions that you guys have left for me under previous episodes and doing my best to provide some answers. Now, before I get into this week's episode, I have a little announcement because next week we are going to try to do a live episode of this show. Now, we've not done a live episode before, so this may turn into a glorious disaster, uh, but hopefully it'll be quite fun while we're doing it. Um, we don't know exactly when we're going to do it yet. Uh, we'll make an announcement on uh, Facebook and Instagram when we know. But those of you guys that are watching this that would like to be involved, um, if you could maybe put in the comments where you are in the world so that we can think about the best time to do the broadcast so that as many of you as possible can, uh, can take part, that would be awesome. Um, all right. First question this episode comes from, uh, actually from two people. So Rob Symington and uh, Thomas McNabb both asked very similar questions about the functional stance. Uh, and in particular, the lower body, the feet, the knees, the, the, the hips, um, and with relation to trying to avoid injury. Okay. Um, so just to contextualize this quickly, um, when we talk about the functional stance, we're talking about the position that we might want to take in order to take control of the board and start performing maneuvers. Okay, there are obviously occasions on certain board designs like long boards and mid lengths and stuff where we may close our feet up and sort of take a more stylized position on the board to try and look as cool as possible or, or, or not in my case. But um, even the best long boarders in the world, when they're trying to take control of the board, they're going to step into that slightly wider stance to get the best possible control over the surfboard. Okay, now the problem is when we take our feet wider than our shoulders, just naturally what's going to happen is that the feet are going to point outwards. Okay, that's just the biomechanics of it. Now, the feet pointing outwards by themselves is not a huge problem. The problem is that when the feet point outwards, when we then bend our knees, our knees go outwards as well. Okay, now in and of itself, this this wouldn't be tragic, but unfortunately, it's just not a very functional position uh, for surfing. Okay, it's a really good default stance for most sports. You know that we have this nice solid base from which we can operate. We you know spread our weight out really really nicely and evenly between each foot, uh, and we, we have this sort of solid immobile uh, platform from which to operate. Now, the downside is not only does it not look particularly good as we're surfing it. But the, the, the big problem is that because our hips are now fairly locked, it's quite difficult to move our weight forwards and backwards on the board in this position. So what we want to do then is we want to bring our uh, feet, uh, or we want to bring our knees inwards. Okay. Now, if we bring our knees inwards while our feet are pointed outwards, what we're going to do is put huge torsion through the, the ligaments of our knees. And the, the most common injury within professional surfing is, you know, blown knees, blown ankles, ACLs, MCLs, things like that. Um, even stuff like, you know, Mick Fanning's uh, hamstring injury, you know, a, a lot of that can be, you know, traced back to this uh, knees inwards, feet outwards um, stance that is, is kind of default. It's what your body will naturally fall into if we're trying to, to control the board like this. So how do we fix this? Well, what we tend to teach uh, here at Surf Simply is for people to, I get my surfboard here. Uh, we tend to try to tell people to have their feet as square as possible on the board, or even a little bit pigeon toed so that the feet are coming inward slightly. Now, the reason for this is obviously by squaring the feet off or having them pigeon toed, the knees are much more likely to come inwards without the same torsion through the knee joint. Um, the other side is this, you want your front foot fairly square on the deck of the board for control. Okay, a lot of people are taught when they start surfing, uh, they're taught to have their front foot at about 45 degrees to, uh, to the board. And the, there are two problems with this. Number one is it really removes your ability to control the, the sideways roll of the board. Um, and particularly as you get more advanced, you start thinking about um, attacking the breaking lip of the wave. Um, it's really easy for the board to roll out from under your foot. On a more immediate problem, pointing that front foot forwards and that front knee forwards puts your weight into your back foot and it, it makes you very back foot heavy as you surf. And it can make it almost impossible to get the weight 
forwards and we lose a lot of control of the board. So by squaring the front foot off, um, that makes that uh, a lot easier. Now, another tactic that's taught and particularly to more advanced surfers and, and often to uh, advanced surfers that have injured their, their knees and they've, they've gone through some rehab and some physio is they're taught to turn their, both their back foot and their front foot very slightly forwards. Not a lot, maybe 10 degrees, 15 degrees perhaps. I might have drawn that a little bit too much there. But we turn both feet slightly forwards. Now, as long as it's not too much, you know, 10, 15 degrees, that's going to be fine. We're still going to have that lateral control of the board and we're still going to be able to bring our weight forwards over our front foot. Um, so that's fine with the front foot. Now with the back foot, what does happen is as you bring your weight forwards, you'll find that with your back foot pointed forwards, you're almost naturally, you'll just go up onto your toes of your back foot. Your back heel will lift off the deck of the board. That's not a problem because it'll only happen once you've got about 80% of your weight over your front foot anyway. So it won't make a huge difference. You'll be able to very comfortably bring your back knee in without any risk of injury, which is great. Now, the only thing it does do is, is if we turn the back knee, the back foot forwards again too much, it's going to offset where our toe versus our heel pressure is on the tail of the board. So again, 10, 15 degrees, probably not a big deal. We're talking, you know, a couple, an inch maybe at the most uh, difference. But if we really start to turn it forwards, you know, 45 degrees or so, it's, it's going to start making a bigger difference. And we're also going to have less, uh, we're not recovering as much width of the, of the board again. So uh, that's two ways to do it. Like I say, when, when we're teaching people to start off, we try to, we generally have them square the feet off because it makes moving the hips really nice and easily. Um, as people become more advanced, this turning both feet forwards can work uh, really well as well. So two tactics there. The big one you want to avoid is having that situation where your back foot is pointed backwards and you're trying to bring your knee in because you're really setting yourself up to do yourself an injury in the long run there. All right, hopefully that was interesting. Hopefully that, uh, that answered those questions. So our next question comes from Moody Moods, who uh, sounds like a great person to hang around with. Um, although possibly Moody Moods has a reason for being uh, a little bit grumpy. Uh, their question was, uh, how does water getting into the board through a ding affect the board's performance? Um, now, the good news is in the short term, it really doesn't affect it very much at all. OK, um, the amount of water that's going to get in through a ding is going to be very, very minimal. There's, there's actually not a lot of um, most foams, you know, they, they can't actually absorb that much water when it comes in. Uh, so, you know, every now and then, you know, someone picks up a board and goes, oh, it's really heavy. It must have soaked up a lot of water. It, it's very, very unlikely that it's actually soaked up uh, enough that, that, you know, you're really feeling a big weight difference. Um, but water in there, even a small quantity of water in the board over a long period of time will cause problems. It will cause the foam to start to degrade and, you know, almost kind of rot away. Uh, it will break down the adhesion between the foam and the fiberglass skin and cause it to delaminate, uh, which then means there's no support for the uh, fiberglass skin, which makes it more likely that it's going to flex and crack and break. Um, it's going to discolor the, uh, the foam, which is going to make it look nasty, which is not a good thing. Um, and so, yeah, generally it, 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 it's not a great thing to, uh, to have happen. Um, so we need to get that water out as quickly as possible. This is the really big thing. Do you think you've got water in the board? We need to get that board out of the water as quick as possible and we need to allow it to dry out. Now, uh, interestingly, a really, really small hole can be a real problem. You know, the, the getting the water back out again can actually be really difficult because there isn't a lot of space for it to evaporate. Sometimes if you've got a small hole and actually it's been in the water for a while, you may actually have to cut away some of the fiberglass to, to allow some more water to evaporate out. Um, best thing you can do if you think you've got a ding, you think you've got a hole, bring yourself back to the beach. You know, if you're not in the middle of a heat, um, you know, bring yourself back into the beach and change it over. You know, a good, good idea is to, you know, keep a roll of tape or, or some stickers or something like that in the car that you can just, you know, whack over the ding really quickly, make it watertight and you can paddle out and carry on surfing and then, and then you know, de deal with the consequences further down the line. Um, as a rule, don't shove wax in the ding. Um, it, it's not the best way of making it waterproof and it's a nightmare trying to get all the wax and the residue off the fiberglass so that you can actually fix it and repair it properly. So yeah, kind of real last resort to start shoving wax in the hole. 
Um, but yeah, I, again, hopefully that answers the question. Uh, short term, not a huge problem. Long term, big problem. So get the water out there as soon as you can. Uh, now, last question that comes from Maeve Costigan. Uh, and Maeve was asking for some tactics for dealing with crowded lineups. Um, she or, or he said that they, they generally surf on the inside, not because they find the idea that the, the waves intimidating paddling out, but the going out into the lineup and, and mixing with the crowd, they find quite intimidating. And uh, Maeve, you are, you are not alone in this. Um, most people I know um, find surfing with, you know, more and more people around them, uh, you know, increasingly intimidating. And, and almost everybody that, that I know, you know, tries to, to you know, not be in other people's way. And the more people there are, the more they worry about it. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely an intimidating situation. Now, um, this is going to be a difficult question for me to answer uh, without upsetting people because we're getting into that touchy subject of uh, etiquette. And although we do have, you know, some fairly universal rules of etiquette, the way that they're applied around the world and interpreted does change. Um, and, and pretty much anything that we talk about in terms of etiquette, um, somebody's going to disagree with us. So uh, I'm going to try and answer this without talking too much about specific etiquette rules and, and really give you just kind of some tactics and mental tactics. Um, my experience is any time people are feeling intimidated and scared in the water, um, it's, it's generally due to us feeling like we're starting to lose control of the situation. You know, human beings um, we're all in our own special little ways. We're all control freaks. And as soon as we feel like our control of the situation and our ability to predict what's going to happen next is, is being eroded, the more it makes us feel a bit nervous and a bit back-footed in that situation. So the, the solution is almost always to try to understand the situation better, try to you know, know and predict what's going to happen next, and to, to do things that take back as much control as possible. Um, and so this is true for, you know, getting caught inside by a big set wave, uh, paddling out into crowds, dealing with bigger or heavier waves that you've not surfed before, you know, all, all, all of these things. Um, so in terms of paddling into a crowd, here are some tactics that we can think about. Okay, so first of all, we need a beach. Okay, so this is going to be a bird's eye view looking down on the beach. Uh, we're going to have a whole bunch of people out in the water. Okay, now this is this <laughs> this is quite a crowded beach. Lots and lots of people sitting in the water now. You know, obviously a lot of beaches are going to show up, and there's going to be you know people are going to cluster around uh, peaks where the waves are breaking. And you know, if there's a really bu busy peak and a quieter peak, you know, maybe it's just better to paddle out at that quieter peak uh, until we feel a bit more comfortable. But let's assume that it's you know a shifty beach break, and everyone's just spread fairly evenly across the beach like this, which kind of be a a worst case scenario if we find crowds intimidating. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. When we paddle out, let's, let's assume that we're this person here, okay, and we're sitting in the water. What you want to do is once you paddle out, you've sat up, okay, what we want to do is we want to try to have as much information as we can. We want to try to understand what's going on around us the best that we possibly can. Okay, so what I like to do is first of all draw a circle around yourself. Now, imaginary circle, maybe maybe fifty meters yards, something like that, around yourself in the water. And most of the time, most of the time, you know, it'd be really unlikely for you to have you know more than about ten people within that circle. That's a crowded lineup if you've got more than ten people in that in that circle. So everyone outside of that, we can kind of eliminate because they're not paddling for the same waves as you. They're paddling for waves on different peaks or ones that are coming in differently. You're not interested in their waves. They're not really interested in your waves. But what we do want to do is be aware of who's coming into our circle, who's leaving it, how many people are in this circle around us. Uh, every beach, unfortunately, is going to have, you know, one or two people um, that are going to be, you know, a bit macho paddling around, puffing their chest out, breaking and bending the rules to get as many waves as they can. And, you know, if one of those people ends up paddling into your circle, it, it may well just be better off moving yourself uh, away from them. You know, they, these people are the uh, the school bullies of the surfing world and they have 
all sorts of other problems in their lives. And, and normally it is better to just move yourself away from them. Um, but let's assume that we don't have to deal with one of those idiots. And uh, we can sit up in the water here. And, and like I say, just be aware of where everybody is. Because the, the thing that a lot of people find intimidating is we sit up and we just, you know, we're watching out to sea for waves. And we see a wave that we want to come. We turn around to paddle and, ah, God, there's lots of people. And we suddenly have to make a lot of decisions and process a lot of data. And we basically just get overwhelmed, we get task saturated and shut down. You know, that, that's, that's what human beings do when we get task saturated, we just kind of freeze. So we want to avoid that. So what I'm gonna do is, although I'm watching for waves, what I'm also doing is just, you know, okay, we've got these two guys over here, I've got this guy over here, what's everybody doing? Uh, this guy's just paddled out, oh, he looks quite tired. Uh, you probably don't need to worry about him catching away for a minute or two. You know, this guy's paddling up and down like a middle of wowzers, okay? That guy ate his Weetabix this morning, he's paddling around all over the place. So, you know, who are these people around us? What, what, what are the tactics that they're employing? So now when a wave comes along and I turn around, I can already start to eliminate some of them. You know, let's say that we had a, a left-hand wave peeling in towards the beach like this, okay? Well, straight away, I can eliminate these two guys. I don't really need to worry about them because we've got priority, okay? We're closer to the peak of the wave. Um, we should be able to, to, to paddle into this wave. Not that we need to forget about them completely. We, we'll, we'll check on them, but it, right here, right now, we don't need to worry about them too much. What we do need to do is as we turn around, we need to look over our right shoulder at these guys here and see if any of them are paddling. Okay, because they're closer to the peak than us. They're going to have priority. Now, maybe they've just paddle out. They're pretty tired. Maybe they're not interested in this wave. Maybe they're having a conversation about the football and haven't noticed the good wave coming. Okay, whatever it is, we're going to check. Now, as we're paddling, if, if one of them's going, it doesn't mean that we can't paddle, but we do need to defer to them. And, you know, as I'm paddling, I'm watching them. And if I give one of those guys a 50 50 chance of catching the wave, I'm going to sit up, I'm going to pull back, I'm going to let them go. And at first, we're not going to be very good at identifying, you know, where that 50-50 moment is. So, you know, let's be a little bit conservative. But, but, you know, even when you're not trying to catch a wave, let's try to watch and, you know, try to learn to spot when someone's got a good chance catching the wave or not, okay? So that you can make better and better calls. So we're paddling in, looks like they're going, we stop. We're paddling in, you know, they haven't got it for whatever reason we're ready, we're, we're, we're rolling. Now, with these two people here, you know, maybe one of them is paddling as well. You know, you're paddling, they're paddling as well. Don't be afraid to let them know that you're there. It's not rude to shout, well, okay, it depends what you shout, but, but in theory, it's not rude to, uh, to, to shout out and let someone know, hey, I'm going, I'm going. It's not rude. Don't, don't, don't be afraid to do it, you know, with caveats. You know, we all have as much right to be out there catching waves as anyone else, okay? So don't be afraid to let people know that you're going for a wave and that, that, that you know, you feel like you've got a good chance of catching it. Now, the last person we just think about is this guy here who's right in front of us, you know? This is always a bit of a nightmare for a lot of people. We turn around, <gasps> there's someone right in front of us. Now, what you need to realize is that when you paddle, you're going to cover a good, again, five to 10 meters or yards before you're even thinking about standing up, okay? You're going to probably paddle past this guy on the inside before you're even thinking about standing up. So all you actually need to do is decide which side of them you want to paddle past them. Do you want to go to the left or the right? And then signal that, you know, even if it's just with your head and, you know, just pointing, okay? Just let that person know which way you're going because they will just be trying to get out of your way. Almost certainly the, the, the biggest thing that they're thinking is, oh God, I'm in the way. So just let them know how to stay clear of you. You know, I'm going this way. And they'll they'll move, they'll, they'll do their best to stay out of the way. Again, you know, keep in mind if, if it looks like it's, you know, we're heading for a collision, just stop, pull back. There's plenty more waves. Um, we don't need to, to, you know, force a collision. But, but in general, if you signal your intentions, people, people will get out of the way. It's something that we don't do very well as surfers. We don't, we don't often talk to each other in the water. And, and, and again, a lot of times, you know, if, 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 if you've got a couple of people, you, you know, you're lining up for a wave, everyone's trying to not get in everybody else's way. And sometimes if you just go, okay, you go left, I'll go right. People are so relieved to have that decision making taking out of, out of their hands that, that you know, it, it can actually be a really positive thing to do. Um, now, I'm going to put two caveats in this. Number one, 
Um, you do not want to be trying to experiment with all of these ideas at the same time that you're finding the conditions intimidating. Okay, you want to be paddling out into conditions that for you are comfortable, you know, inside your comfort zone. They're not too big, they're not too steep, not too stormy or, or anything like that. You're really happy with the waves. And we're just now learning to, to, to read the crowd and understand it a little bit more. Okay. As soon as you're starting to deal with bigger waves, more powerful waves, any other situation about it that you find intimidating, you don't want to be adding crowds in on top of that. Okay. So, so, so don't overwhelm yourself. Choose your moments. The second thing is this. Okay. A really, really good tactic for dealing with some of this is find somebody who will paddle out with you. Okay. Uh, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's an instructor, maybe it's a guide. But find someone who will go out with you and just help you to navigate the lineup. OK, as again, as surfers, we're, we're terrible at admitting that we have weaknesses in, in, in our abilities and, and, you know, taking help from people. But, you know, this is what pro surfers do. You know, if they're showing up at somewhere they've never been before. Almost invariably, they're making some sort of contacts, you know, quite often through their sponsors and things. But they're making contacts with people that surf those waves all the time to allow them to, to, to navigate the lineup and not upset too many people and, and, and get some waves. And, you know, even places that have a reputation for being, you know, very, very, uh, you know, localized um, places, you know, big crew of locals, you're unlikely to get waves. You know, people still show up at these places every year and get waves and, and surf perfectly happy. You know, whether it's the North Shore of Hawaii or, you know, Padang Padang out in Bali or, or Chopu in Tahiti. If you can make connections with people that know that lineup and have them chaperone you a little bit, that's often the best way of dealing with these situations without it being intimidating and scary and without, or, you know, at least minimizing the risk of, of you know, upsetting anyone. But like I say, I fall back on the, the previous statement as well, but you want to be paddling out and testing a, a lineup that you're unsure about. You want to be doing it in surf conditions that you're very, very comfortable with. And if the surf conditions are what you're pushing and testing yourself in, you want to be doing it in a lineup that you feel comfortable with. So yeah, anyway, I hope that was interesting. Um, uh, let me know your thoughts on it. And uh, yeah, hopefully I will see a whole lot of you in our live show next week. Um, but for now, that's all I've got for you. So take care, have a great week and uh, see you later. Bye-bye.